you know, the fable of bees basically describe this dream that our society could work like a beehive. And the beehive is so perfectly organized, you know, it's really surprising. And there is a queen bee, but it doesn't give commands to all the other bees. You know, it just lays eggs, that's it. So this is all very surprising. And therefore, the idea came up, okay, if we just all did the thing that we can do best, that would create the greatest advantage to our economy and to our society. Well. And basically, that created this commandment you should do what's best for you. And as we know, it doesn't always work well. And we have to look into this a little bit more carefully. But sometimes now coordination in our society works impressively and produces beautiful outcomes. Yes, and of course Adam Smith is one of these famous people for, uh, who is known for this principle of the invisible hand. And what I'm claiming is that with the technology of the Internet of Things, we can now make the invisible hand work. I mean, 300 years after its invention, it's now possible to do this. And I'm giving you here an example for the case of traffic light control. Now the problem of traffic light control is there are so many things that you can vary, like the order of the traffic lights, uh, the period of the green time, the time shift between this intersection and that intersection and so on. So in a even medium sized city it's not possible to do this optimization in real time. There are just too many possibilities. It's an NP hard optimization problem. So, what do you do? Well, intelligent people came up with this idea that you could run each intersection in a cyclical way, and then you would have to synchronize the cycles, and that's it. You know? And in fact, uh, what you do is you measure basically how traffic changes in the course of the day and the week, and then you average over Monday mornings, 10 o'clock, and Friday evening, 4 o'clock, and so on. And for each of these time windows, you create optimal traffic light controls offline. And you apply it at that time of the day and the week. And you could also then measure the actual traffic flows because there's a lot of deviation from the average typical course. Uh, in fact, the variability is as big as the average. And so you would uh, extend or shorten green times, but you would stay within this cycle. Still not good enough. It's not good enough um, because the variability of the flow turning right, going straight, or whatever, is 100% approximately. So you have an optimal control for a situation that never occurs in reality. And that's why I started to say, why don't we come with a traffic light control which is, first of all, flexible? Uh, if you cannot predict the situation, then you should be able to respond flexibly to the situation. It means to the real local needs. Yes, and so we looked into these three possibilities, an optimal top-down, attempt, control attempt, like a benevolent dictator that would collect information from all over the city and try to come up with an optimal outcome, which I said uh, is still unfortunately not optimal, and then implement that like a benevolent dictator. You know? So control all the traffic lights. Uh, number two is the Homo economicus. In this case, each single intersection is separately minimizing the travel times of all the vehicles that are approaching this intersection. 
I mean, each intersection strictly does the optimal thing in terms of travel times of that intersection. Yeah? Every intersection does the best. So that's kind of the principle of the Homo economicus, and that's what you know, the standard economic model would demand. And, and this is a similar approach, but with one difference. If one of the queues grows large and beyond a certain what we call critical limit, it would first be cleared before we go back to the trouble time minimization. So it doesn't, it doesn't strictly minimize trouble times. We'll see, however, that it, it will nevertheless altogether, on average, reduce travel times. So what does top-down regulation do? Well, what you see is, uh, is if capacity utilization goes up, the queue lengths of vehicles goes up too. I mean, no surprise. Yeah. Well, let's see how the principle of the homo economicus, the selfish local optimization does. And in fact, it's much better. You know, much shorter queue lengths. And the surprise, however, is that suddenly, long before the full capacity utilization, the queue length explodes. So we can do, say two things. Here, Adam Smith's principle of the invisible hand works up to this point. Yeah? So we have a self-organized coordination, uh, and very efficient. But if we push the system too far, if we demand too much from it, the coordination principle breaks down. So it fails here. And then suddenly, this traffic control center, the benevolent dictator says, ah, uh, oh, Fortunately, you have me uh, because you know, I'm making sure that we can still operate the system here at these high capacity utilizations yeah, during the rush hour. That's true. Surprisingly, however, there is even a better solution. And this better solution is the one where we have this other regarding optimization it means where each intersection takes care of not producing queues that reach up to the next intersection because that would create spillover effects. And these spillover effects would create so ma many disturbances that it would create uh, a massive congestion in a large area of town. May I just ask the question? So, what do you refer to the Adam Smith principle? Because is that just like selfish behavior in your interpretation? Because I would argue that also it's an other regarding optimization process. This, this is just uh, local optimization uh, without the taking care of your neighbors. Right, but then you suggest that the Adam Smith, the invisible hand. So, what kind of like an optimization principle lays behind that? In the previous slide, I guess you had that. Right? This curve relates to a minimization of travel times of all the vehicles heading towards a certain intersection. Based on self-maximization. Yes. And that's Adam Smith, as you would say. Yeah. And that works well here, but fails over there. While the difference here with this other regarding optimization is that we interrupt the minimization of trouble times. If there's a long queue, and we would first clear this long queue before we go back to the minimization of trouble times. Why is this important, and why is this other regarding? Because we don't let this queue grow up to the next intersection, where it would disturb the traffic flow at that intersection. You, know, you could say, OK, why should I, as this intersection care about my neighboring intersection. But the point is, there's so much disturbance that is caused by long queues that it would mess up the entire traffic system in this area. And so doing 
having a little bit slower service avoids disruption in neighboring intersections. And so on average, cars are faster. Yeah. So in principle, what we can say is that this is also a local optimization, but it takes into account the externalities. Yeah. And that's a major insight, because what I'm saying is if you take into account externalities, then you can make the invisible hand work based on local optimization. That's this difference. Taking into account externalities is the main point. And in fact, what you get is beautiful green waves and improvements for all modes of transport, like uh, individualized traffic, public transport, pedestrians and cyclists and and it makes also travel times more predictable and is good for the environment too. So rather than having a top-down control of traffic through the traffic lights, we now have traffic flows that bottom up control the traffic lights. Yeah? We have a completely different principle. Now, the question is, could we also use this to improve the efficiency of economic and social processes? And my claim is yes. Oh, that's what we had already, sorry. Uh, and in fact, there is this Nobel Prize winner, Eleanor Ostrom. She made studies in Switzerland, by the way, of communities that governed themselves. That uh, they, they had uh, so-called uh, common goods, public goods, and um, usually economists assume that they will end up in a tragedy of the commons. But what Eleanor Ostrom showed was that there exist a number of rules. If you imply, apply these kind of rules, then a self-governance would work, and it would be efficient. And that's kind of logical to a complexity scientist. Now, if you have the right kind of rules, the system would self-organize and produce a functionality that you would want to have. If you have the wrong set of rules, the system would also self-organize, but it would uh, create an undesirable outcome. So everything depends on the set of rules, on, on the interactions. Now, the question is, how can we make the interactions more favorable in terms of their outcomes? Yeah? And so I came up with a patent on social information technologies. And it basically looks into four kinds of situations. So we assume interactions of two people or two companies or a company in the environment, whatever. And it could be a lose-lose situation where the interaction is bad for both sides. Yeah. So what should we do? Well. Better avoid that situation. Uh, then there could be a win-lose situation. That means the interaction would be good for one side, but bad for the other side. Now, if it's altogether bad, it means it causes a deterioration, then we need to basically protect uh, the The, the potentially losing side from exploitation because the winning side would like to engage into this interaction, but it would be bad for the other side and bad altogether. But it could also be a situation where it's good for one side, but bad for the other. Altogether, however, it would create a benefit. So what should we do then? Well, we'd like this interaction to happen, but we would have to turn a win-lose situation into a win-win situation. We can do this by a value transfer, so it will become beneficial for both sides. 
And finally, it could be a win-win situation. And we should engage into this interaction, obviously, but we could improve fairness if we want. And so the four in social information technology that would support us in these kind of situations, and one of these is the, what I call the social mirror. It would support <coughs> situational or context awareness. The social adapter, maybe a bit awkward word, which facilitate profitable interactions, support us in interactions with others. The social protector, with avoid lossful interactions and social money which incentivize favorable interaction or support value transfer. So this is about self-organizing systems that become possible through real-time information. And then finally, we could also engage into creating collective intelligence. So this is about bringing the best ideas of many minds together. And we don't know a lot about how this needs to be done. So this is really a hot topic. But here is an interesting example. Netflix is offering video on demand, or TV on demand, as you like. And they want to offer their customers interesting movies. Of course, if you're not happy with their services, you know, you might change to somebody else's services. So they're trying to predict the movies that you like based on your own ratings of previously seen movies and ratings of other people who have seen similar movies. And they're not very good at this. Even though this is a big data approach, I think they guess, est estimate, I should say, they estimate 10% of uh, predictions uh, of, 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 uh, of likings on a five-star system, right? And they said, okay, uh, we want to improve this, and it's worth a million to us if you can improve this prediction by 10%. 10% is not much, come on, right? And so there were, one million is a lot, however, right? So there were hundreds of groups who were engaging into this competition, thousands of solutions that were submitted, and it took more than two years. Actually, there was not a single team that managed to win this competition by itself. And then there's this rumor that one day, uh, the, the boss of the winning team uh, has been kind of uh, here, uh, uh, of, of, the, of the leading team was one day stepping to the office and said to the team, come on, shouldn't we maybe do something else again after two years? And, and then the team leader said, all right, then maybe we should take another approach. And what he said is, let us team up with another team, or two other teams even, and as they were the best in this competition, and now they had to team up with two teams that were worse, and that didn't have as good solutions as they had themselves. So I would think if you average over the best solution with two solutions that are worse, it would produce a worse solution. But that was wrong. That was totally wrong. It was an even better solution. And they won the competition. So what we can say is that uh, in complex optimization problems, diversity wins and not the best. Only by many teams. So each of them would, would first of all, you know, in a competitive way, try to come up with the best solution. But then we need a cooperation phase where we engage into something together. So exploration and integration. Okay, so these are all the functionalities that we want to reach. And then the question is what kind of information system would we need to build to enable all this? And I call this the planetary nervous system. So one day, um, I woke up and became 
aware that basically it's in our heads to build such a system because all it takes is you and your smartphone. Why? Because we can use the sensors in this smartphone. There are about 15 sensors for luminosity, noise, location, whatever. Now, we could use this and connect the smartphones together to build a global measurement network. So as compared to a big data approach that's collecting all the data that you can get and then finally tries to find some patterns that are there or not, but maybe spurious patterns, here we would create a targeted, a tailored measurement as we used to do that in physics. In fact, take the elementary particle acceleration at CERN. 99.9% .9 of all the data that are recorded are thrown away immediately because uh, they couldn't be processed anyway. They just keep 0.1% of all data and they keep that 0.1% that is interesting for a particular kind of experiment. So, each experiment makes a different kind of measurement. It's a tailored measurement process. And this is exactly what we would need. And the Internet of Things would enable us to do this. So, for example, we can measure acceleration, x, y, z. And then the question, what can we do with it? Well, for example, we could detect earthquakes because if just one smartphone shakes, uh, that has no meaning, but if all our smartphones shake at the same time, then ooh, something is fishy here, you know, it would be an earthquake and it could warn our friends and family members uh, a few hundred kilometers away, it would give them some extra seconds to get into a safe, to a safe place. So what would we do in case of an earthquake? Well, we care about our survival. You know, in Switzerland, we have this beautiful survival kit over here. The question is, what would be tomorrow's survival kits? And what I did is I organized uh, a hackathon with a, a number of colleagues in San Francisco. And you know, San Francisco is really threatened by an earthquake. And the question was, what could we do in such a situation? There were about 80, 90 people who signed up for this hackathon. And about nine or 10 teams that they formed, and three of them were the winning teams, and these are the solutions that they created. So first of all, Amigo Cloud. They came up with an app that allows you to take pictures of a destroyed bridge or road or whatever was wrong you could annotate it, and you could do that of many different places. And as soon as you had connectivity, your smartphone was connected uh, with the web, it would upload all this information. So it would create a map of this environment. If many neighbors do this, then long before emergency units would be in this place, they could already know what has happened there, and all the neighbors too. Now, the question is, would you have internet connectivity because basically electricity would most likely be down after an earthquake. So then it's important to have something like an ad hoc network, you know, like uh, um, fire chat is, for example, enabling smartphones in the future to talk to each other. And we would still need to charge our smartphones and that could be done with charge beacon. So there would be these uh, solar panels that, that uh, would allow you to charge your smartphone. At the same time, we would get together with people from the neighborhood and we would have an each exchange of information and community spirit and all this kind of thing. And finally, there was Helping Hands. That was another app where it could basically upload information such as I need some water, I need baby food, I need some help for my grandfather or whatever. 
And other people could respond and say, okay, um, I looked what I still have at home, and in fact, I have some water left, I, I have some fuel in reserve, I, I can provide some clothes or whatever. And so demand uh, and supply would find together locally. So this would enable people to help each other. And in this way, it would not only reduce response times, because it often takes 72 hours for disaster response to be fully operational, and these are the critical three days. It would free up the resources of this disaster response team, so they could focus on these areas that really need the help most. And it would create more bandwidth, more capacity, because citizens would engage here. So uh, basically, um, we, we have a more participatory system, and that, as we can see, would be much more powerful. Now, if when we build this planetary nervous system, we would like to have a system that we can trust. Yeah, it shouldn't just steal data from our smartphones and look at uh, what we're talking and who we're meeting with. And at least I would prefer one that uh, also respects my privacy. And I think such a system can be built in a way that nevertheless supports social order and cooperation. But for us to be able to trust the system, transparency is needed. And control is needed about our information flow. So basically, for each of these centers, we, oh, we could say, um, I want to use it just for myself, the data stream, or I want to share it. And later on, we could also say, whom to share it with, for what purpose. And that would require something like uh, open personal data store and well, all the information that happens to be collected about you would be sent. And then you could administer all these data and say, okay, I'm sharing my shopping data with companies because I want to get a personalized product or service. But I'm not sharing my health data with companies. I'm sharing my health data just with my doctor. And my social friendship network I'm just sharing with my friends. You know, Whatever you think is the appropriate sharing of your data, you could control it. And so the idea is to build this planetary nervous system as, as a citizen web. I mean, all of us would build it together to everyone's benefit. <coughs> now, it's important that the state can trust in this system too, right? So how would we reach this? First of all, um, we would have to think about responsible innovation. Uh, we would uh, create coordination tools that have been missing in the past because social chaos happens when coordination breaks down or is not there in the first place. Uh, we would probably restrict free data volume so uh, we cannot produce, produce much damage local interactions, then uh, something like a radar screen that would basically uh, check that there wouldn't be malicious applications, at least not many as compared to the benefits. Uh, large scale applications would certainly have to be monitored because they could be impactful. We would uh, try to build something like a digital immune system that would um, block uh, malicious applications. We would try to build uh, something like crowd security approaches and incentive systems to behave in a responsible way. And one of these systems, as I pointed out before, could be reputation systems. And finally, also, merit-based mechanisms could uh, support responsible behavior, too. And of course, it seems a good idea to take uh, public institutions on board from the very beginning. 
So if we do all this, I think we can create a wonderful open data source, a real-time data Wikipedia in a sense. And that would be a participatory system. That means you and I, we could all use it. We could all design it together too. And you can see it's a lot of fun to work on this kind of system. And we can actually use it to create games or turn cities into adventures and many things. Here's just one application. Um, we could uh, come up with something like um, Minecraft, but using the Internet of Things as input. So the main point here is that it's not going to be an app that, say, my team or whom, whomever's team is creating and restricting your application. It would be as open as possible. So you could combine inputs and outputs as you like. You could create your own games. You could create your own measurement processes and applications. And uh, a, a funny game is this one, uh, which you could uh, use to solve conflicts. So assume you have different parties at home, and some want to see the, uh, the, uh, the love story on TV, and the others want to see uh, the adventures uh, movie and and so you have to take a decision and here is the a virtual arm wrestling that we came up with so, so uh, the, they have to figure it out and what they're doing is they're using now the accelerometers uh, basically to have a, a team wise arm wrestling with each other and you can see uh, team B was winning. But in, in principle, you can do similar stuff uh, like co conflict resolution games uh, with other sensors, you know? And you could create your own games uh, to solve these kind of uh, problems. Okay, so what are the key components of such a system? Um, a storage engine, local analytics engine, a data broker, a system optimizer, virtual sensors, actuation scheduler and a global analytics engine and finally a routing agent. We'd also like to add a micropayment system and with this you could then create your own business. So the point is, as I said, it would be an open data stream for everyone, a real-time data stream, a targeted measurement that you can do and that means you can open a consultancy, you can come up with your own services using these data, you can come up with your own products, uh, in particular if you use 3D printers and other stuff at home. So this is where the jobs will come about. You, know. you take the data, you transform it into something useful. You do this. And you could collaborate with others. <coughs> so based on this idea of prosumer. So why don't we do this together? Build this system jointly and the principle would be give and take. So basically you can take data, but the system obviously works only if you give your own data back, and some of your data at least, right? If you open some of the sensors. And in the very same way would we do that for the source codes that are used to measure certain things or you know, to, to produce certain kinds of functionality. So people today are very much into sharing of codes like at GitHub. And again, you could take a code that somebody else has produced. But probably it would not do exactly what you want.